Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the class on Romans. Thank you, online students, for joining us. Also want to welcome our e-learning students who are listening to this lecture later on. Um, we'll begin with um, a word of prayer. So can any one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Where's the mic? Or our online student, anyone, or in person, anyone can lead. Go ahead, Nina. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time you have given each one of us, Lord, to study your word and to understand you, Lord, and to, 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 to be really a useful uh, in our lives, Lord. We submit each one of us unto your loving hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Okay, so we began looking at chapter 2 uh, last week, and here in chapter 2, just give you a, a brief background again, a recap. Uh, Paul is addressing the Jewish believers. So this Jews came from a very strong background of law and circumcision, and uh, you know now they have embra embraced Christ. So Paul is logically addressing the Jewish believers. He's telling them that they have the law, they teach the law, but they themselves uh, you know, uh, use the law to correct others when they are doing wrong. And they tell them, hey, this is not right, this is not wrong. But they themselves don't keep the law. Okay, so that is a big concern. And he says, you are using the law to judge others, but you yourself are not keeping the law. And for the Jews, they took great pride in the law and they took great pride in the covenant of circumcision. Okay, so then Paul is saying that, you know, if you have the law and you don't keep it, you break it and you are circumcised, you know, it's good as being uncircumcised when you don't keep the law. Okay. And then he says, because when you don't keep the law and you judge others as well, you are going to bring about judgment of God on yourselves. And then he's telling the Gentiles, hey, you don't have the law. You've not been given the law, but you have a law that is in your hearts, which tells you what is right and wrong. And what is that law? The conscience. Yes. And so he says, you have the uh, conscience. And also you can't say, hey, we do not know God because God has already given you two things that are inbuilt in you. What are the two things that are inbuilt in you? Reason and conscience. So your reason, you know, when you look at creation, uh, he tells us in Romans chapter, speaks about this in Romans chapter 1. It says when you look at creation, creation reveals the invisible attributes of the Godhead is eternal power and no one is without excuse. So he says, hey, when you look at creation, okay, and you reason how is everything so perfect and so beautiful, you know it leads you to a God. And you, when you seek this God, this God will come and reveal himself to you. When you seek God, you will find him okay and then he says the inbuilt law which is written on your hearts for the gentiles is the conscience okay but then he goes on to say that hey you both jews and gentiles you will not be judged by the law by the conscience but you will be judged according to the gospel of jesus christ okay and then towards the end of the chapter he's talking about circumcision which the jews are very proud about and he says um what God is interested is not in the physical circumcision, but he's talking, he's interested in the circumcision of the heart. So he says, hey, a real Jew is somebody who's circumcised in the heart. That means, you know, their heart is right before God. So why is Paul talking about all of these things? Why is he talking about the law? Why is he telling the Jews you have the law? Why is he telling the Gentiles you have the conscience and the reason? And, you know, the Jews have the circumcision, but you will be judged by the uh, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do you think he's talking all of these things? Because basically Paul is trying to establish here in chapter 2, you know, after his introduction to the church at Rome, he's establishing here that, hey, both of us Jews and Gentiles are sinners before God. And all of us, whether we have the law, the circumcision, the reason, the conscience, we all have fallen short of the glory of 
God. We have all fallen short of God's righteousness. And it's interesting how he builds on this. And then he moves on to chapter 3 where he's talking about uh, sin and he's talking about faith. And in chapter 4, he's talking about the grace of God. Okay, So how beautifully he's building on it. So in verses 2 to 11, which we studied last week, uh, what is Paul developing there? He's basically telling the Jews, you have the law, you can teach the law, you use the law to judge others because you know what is right and wrong. But if you yourself are not doing what is right, you will be judged by those same things. Okay, So don't think you can escape the judgment of God. And then Paul is saying that, hey, we will all be judged by God because he's a righteous judge. But Paul says in verse 4, the goodness of God leads people to repentance. Okay, So he's saying we who know the word of God, we can judge people and we can be quick to point out what is right and wrong. But he says, don't forget that the goodness of God leads to repentance. This does not mean that we do not condone sin. That does not mean that we don't overlook sin or we encourage sin or not that we don't deal with it, but we need to be gracious and loving, knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance. And twice he says, for, first for the Jew, then for the Greek. Another word for Greek is Gentile. So he says, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But why does he say first for the Jew? Because they are the ones who have the law. They were given the law first. Okay, And then verses 12 to 16, Paul goes to talk about how everyone will be judged. And that is where we stopped in verse 16. Can somebody read verse 16, please? Again, we look at it. Verse 16, in that day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Yes. So here, uh, Paul is saying that, you know, um, uh, like I, I mentioned um, last week, that, you know, everyone will be judged according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will be judged according to, in the beginning of chapter 2, we saw in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, they will be judged according to the truth. If you look at uh, Romans chapter 2, the same chapter, verse 4, um, No, was the, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, it says, the judgment of God is according to the truth. Okay. And we look at verse 5, he says, the judgment of God is a righteous judgment. And if you look at verse 11, he says, there is no partiality with God. So the judgment of God is based on what? The truth, that is the word of God. And it's also a righteous judgment that we saw in verse 5 and then it's also a judgment without partiality okay so he says that um you know we will all be judged according to the truth that is according to the gospel of jesus christ he's saying you will not be judged according to the law you will not be judged according to the conscience but you will be judged according to the gospel of jesus Christ. And then we went on to ask this important question, what happens to those who do not hear the gospel? How will they be judged? Okay. So, so far what Paul has explained in chapter 1 and 2, that there are people who have the law, there are people who don't have the law, and there are two things who, of, that God has given to people who don't have the law. Every person has a reason. I already mentioned what is that. Every person has a conscience, whether it's a Jew or Gentile. So these two things are reason and conscience are directing us or convicting us and telling us that there is a God and that you should seek after this living God. And every person who seeks after God, God in some way will bring the gospel to that person okay now if you can ask a question what if the person dies before he hears the gospel what will happen okay so we, all we can say from what we have in scripture is they have the reason they have the conscience the conscience tells them what is the truth conscience tells them of the living god that you have to seek him that uh, you know um, and when they seek him they will hear about jesus christ but we do not know when they die, what happens. We All we know is what we have from verse 16. Everyone will judge, be judged according to the 
gospel. No excuse. So we can ask, will God have any other way to judge people who have never heard the gospel before? The scripture doesn't mention anything. Hence, we cannot come up with another alternative and we cannot come up with any alternate option. All we know is that in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay. So what is this gospel? It's the gospel that all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Okay. And what is the gospel? Without Christ, there is no salvation. And all who take on the name of the uh, 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 the name of God will be saved. And there is no other name under heaven given to men by which they can be saved under the name of Jesus. Okay. So we cannot say that God will use conscience to judge people who have not heard the gospel. That is wrong conclusion. We can't say that God will use co people's conscience to judge them who have not heard the gospel. And that is why the need is there for us to proclaim and share the gospel, right? Because everyone will be share, judged according to the gospel. All of you with me? Yes, you're able to understand? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So uh, we cannot say that God will use conscience to judge uh, people who have not heard the gospel. That is wrong conclusion. What we can say is he will use the gospel and the gospel will be reached to every person okay we'll move on uh, verses 17 and 18 can somebody read that please indeed you are called a jew and raised on the law and make your worst in god and now and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law amen so here we see there's a strong rebuke to the Jews. Paul is strongly rebuking the Jews. He's saying, hey, you Jews, you're resting or you're trusting or you're relying on the law and you're boasting about the law, okay, in God. And he says, we know his will and we can, and you, you're saying you know his will, you know what is right and wrong. But Paul is telling them that, hey, you know what is right and wrong. You teach the law of God, but you yourself are not doing it. You yourself are breaking the law. So what Paul is basically doing is he's building up his case against the Jews to tell the Jews and Gentiles that all of us are sinners and that we need to the grace of God, only the grace of God that is in Christ Jesus, we are saved by grace through faith. So that is what he goes on to talk in chapter 3, 4, and 5. We're saved by grace through faith. So he's building up his case here and he's telling the Jews, hey, it's true that you have the law and you know everything in the law, but you are not keeping the law. You're breaking the law and that is sin. That is wrong. You will be judged by it. Okay. Verses 19 to 24. Can somebody read 19 to 24, please? And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babies, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not still do you still you who say do not commit adultery do you commit adultery you who adore idol idols do you rob temples you who make your boast in the law do you dishonor god through break breaking the law for the name of god is blessed among the gentiles because of you as it is written Thank you. So here in verse 24, he says the name of God is blasphemed. Okay. Why is the name of God blasphemed? Why is the name of God blasphemed? Because you are talking about the law. You are judging people by the law. You know the law and you are not keeping your it yourself. Okay. So you're blaspheming. God and he's saying you're doing exactly what the law does not require you to do.
do. You're doing opposite of what the law says. So he says, you know, you who say do not steal, you steal yourself. Those who you say do not commit adultery, you yourself commit adultery. You know, you who abhor idols, you know, you who uh, don't, uh, 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 you know, dislike idols, detest or hate idols, idolatry and uh, idol worship, you yourself are robbing God of giving him what is rightfully his in terms of tithe, in terms of your honor, in terms of the diligence that is, you know, required of God, that you need to give God, you're robbing God. And so he's saying that you, when you do this, you're blaspheming the name of God. Okay. We move on to verses 25 to 29. Verse 25 to 29. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge, judge you who? Even with your written code or, and circumcision are a trans, transgressor of the law. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor in circumcision that which is outward in the flesh but he is a jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit not in the letter whose praise is not from the men but from god amen thank you so in verses 25 to 29 paul go goes on to talk about another aspect that the jews are very proud about and what is that the covenant of circle the sign of the covenant which is circumcision so he goes on to talk about the issue of circumcision which the jews are very proud about and it's a sign of the covenant that god makes with them so he says jews you know um, they say we are circumcised and circumcision is a sign of the covenant with god but he says look even if you are circumcised and you are still breaking the law, you are not doing what is right, or you're not doing the right thing. Then he's saying that circumcision, which is a physical sign of your covenant, amounts to nothing before God, right? Because you're breaking the covenant by not keeping the law. So this is nothing, absolutely nothing. So he says if the uncircumcised, and who are the uncircumcised? the Gentiles, he says, if the uncircumcised keep the law and do things that are right, then shouldn't we say that even though they are uncircumcised, they are, they are as good as circumcised? Are you able to understand Paul's, you know, logical reasoning here? If you, if you study Romans, it's basically very beautifully how Paul discusses and, you know, logically reasons with the Jews coming to their mindset and thinking from their mindset and talking from their mindset and from their viewpoint. Okay, so he's saying that hey, you're saying these people are uncircumcised and they're no good, they have to be circumcised. And they said, What's the point? You know, if they are uncircumcised and they are able to keep the law, then isn't it good as being circumcised? Okay, because they're doing what is right before God. So in verses 28 to 29, Paul is saying that what really matters is not circumcision of the flesh, which is a physical circumcision, but he's saying the circumcision of the heart. And what does he mean? He's saying about a change in the heart. Okay, A change in the heart where it's talking about God is taking away a heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh. So the understanding here is not about Paul is telling them, hey, outward rituals, keeping the law, rituals, circumcision, you know, all of these, keeping this feast and eating this uh, certain kind of food, all of these outward things is not important. The inward change is what is important and not the physical circumcision. Session. Okay. So if you looked and observed that in chapter two, we did not do a word or phrase or verse study in detail. We just looked at it in, um, you know, we did a different kind of a study here, you know, um, just basically looking at the main insights that are presented in chapter 
two. Okay, there are some more important things given in your notes. I've actually uh, thought apart from the notes, but you know, we'll just look at our notes and look at some important uh, points there. Before that, we will go to Nina John's uh, question or query here. Uh, does the judgment we are talking about come into operation when we judge as in verse 1 and it goes on and verse 2, the judgment is according to the truth. Yeah, so you're talking about um, when God judges us, is that what you're saying? The judgment of God and the way He judges us? Yes, yes. That's what yeah. I was asking. I mean, yeah. how so yes, the judgment. Yeah. yeah. So the judgment of God, like we see, like I mentioned, also is given in your notes, is based on the truth. We said that they will all be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? The truth. The truth of the gospel. So here in verse um, um, two, he says, but we know that the judgment of God is according to the truth. Okay. And also in verse five, he says that righteous judgment of God. So when God judges, his judgment will be righteous. And also we see in verse 11 that his judgment is without partiality. So he's basically talking about judgment. The, and he's also saying that why will we be judged? Because we've all sinned and we've been fallen short of the glory of God and his righteous standard. But even if God is a judge, he will judge based on these things. His righteousness truth and his he will judge without partiality did that help um, nina john did that help yes, nina yes okay. yes yes thank you yeah. okay thank you so we'll uh, just move on to your notes uh, if you can open your notes to chapter Two. Okay. Um, so here we see in this chapter, Paul is basically uh, just going through, running through what we already studied, but just looking at few things that uh, uh, can reiterate what we learned. In this chapter, we see Paul uh, challenging the attitude of the Jews towards the Gentiles. What is the attitude of Jews towards the Gentiles? What were the Jews doing towards the Gentiles? What were they doing? They were judging them, right? They were judging them on various things, the law, the circumcision, this is not right, that is not right, the law says this, so they're judging them. And so um, Paul is also in chapter 2 presenting an understanding of God's judgment. How he will judge, what he will judge, and when he will judge. And we'll look at that. Also, he's talking about the work of the conscience. And uh, in the end, he's presenting who a true Jew is. Okay. Um, so we'll uh, just look at... Um, these points in uh, detail. He's basically challenging the attitudes of the Jews towards the Gentiles. Okay, so um, when we consider these truths, how can we apply them to ourselves as Christians who have the Word of God, can understand the truth, and how we view those who do not have the truth? Okay, so Paul challenges the Jews and their attitudes by saying, you know, judging others require that I must be accountable to the same standard. Sometimes we judge others based on the word of God, right? So when we judge them, are we also judging ourselves on the same standard, on the same things? So we are doing the same things and we're telling others not to do it. Are we judging others and practicing the wrong I condemn? When we do that, it will not permit. It will. We will not escape the the judgment of God. And also, he says that God is forbearing. He is long suffering, right? And it is His goodness that will lead people to repentance. So the patience of God, His long suffering, His forbearance. And then we also see that God is a righteous judge. He will judge without partiality for all who do evil or wrong 
for the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. Why do the Jews first? Because they were given the law first. The law of God was given to them first. Okay, And those who have the law, God will judge them according to the law. But God has his own way determined to judge those outside the law. Okay, And then he says, Jews, they are very proud that you have the law, you have the circumcision. But Paul is making very clear that, you know, it's not any of these things will amount to their righteousness or to their conviction of sin or forgiveness of sin. But if they violate the law, you know, they will stand condemned. Okay. And then he talks about how God will judge, what he will judge, and when he will judge. So how does God judge? He judges according to the truth, that is the gospel, the word of God. He will judge according to righteousness because he's a righteous judge. He will judge without partiality and he will judge according to the gospel. Okay, And we know that um, God's word is truth. And uh, uh, Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 says, your word is truth, sanctify them by the truth. So he's telling, praying to the Father and saying, your word is truth, Father. You sanctify these people, the believers, with the truth. Okay, And look at what John chapter 12, verses 47 and 48 says. Can somebody read that, please? And if anyone hears my words and does not, does not believe, I do not judge, judge him. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. What will judge him on the last day? The word that I have spoken. So ultimately, we'll all be judged by the word of God, the truth of God, and in righteousness, without partiality, and according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. So the other things we have covered, what will happen to those who have not heard the gospel. We've already spoken about that. Okay. Um, so what God judges, what does he judge? Here in uh, verses 6 to 11, God will judge our deeds. Okay. Obedience versus the truth, righteousness versus disobedience. He will also judge us based on our desires, what we are seeking, whether we are seeking his glory, his honor, his immortality, or we are seeking for ourselves, okay? Our um, selfish ambition, our selfish uh, uh, passions, and lustful carnal passions, okay? Verse 16, he says he will judge us by our motives. He will judge the secret motives of people's heart by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So these are the three areas where God would judge our deeds, our desires, and our motives. Okay? Um, can somebody read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, please? First Corinthians chap oh, chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord comes, who will who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. Yeah, so here he's saying that the God will judge us, and we're not asked to judge anything before the appointed time, but God will judge and he will judge the motives of our hearts, the purpose and the motives of our heart. Okay. So whether your Jews or Gentiles, he's saying you've fallen in three areas. We're all sinned in these areas. We have sinned in the area of our deeds, our desires, and in our motives. Okay. So what is Paul's intent here? He's basically again repeating, he's saying that all of us, you know, we have fallen short of God's righteousness, his standard, and um, we've all sinned and we will all be judged in these areas because we have fallen or transgressed in these areas. When does when will God judge? In verse 5, he says the day of wrath. Verse 16, he says the day when God will judge. So there is an appointed day that is set apart when God will 
judge. Okay. So look at what Acts chapter 17 verse 31 says. Can somebody read that please? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So he's, the father is appointed a certain day when he will judge and he will judge through whom? Who is the man there? Jesus Christ whom he is raised from the dead. Okay. And then talks about the conscience which I have already spoken. Right. In detail. Yes or no. So I'm not going to go through that. And also talked about the two inbuilt indicators, reason and conscience. But just like to focus about what the scripture talks about conscience in different conditions in the different parts of the world. Talks about a good conscience. Talks about a conscience without offense. A pure conscience. A seared conscience. A defiled and an evil conscience. So the Bible speaks about all of these different kinds of conscience. Yes, so the conscience is like an inbuilt law in us. And it's possible even as we go through life, even as we journey through life, when we continue to <coughs> sorry, indulge in sin, continue to do things that are wrong uh, in, uh, in, in, in immoral behavior, in things that are wrong and not pure and holy, that we can corrupt defile and sear our conscience you know what is the meaning of sear right seared conscience means it's it's like you know when when you are ironing and uh, you place a hot iron on the cloth and it just pulls it apart it tears tears it apart it's like that it's seared conscience you know your nerve endings when it's burnt it's basically the sun so seared conscience um and defiled conscience, okay, so it says that, you know, a weak conscience, so our conscience, when we are continually, continually doing things that are wrong, that are not right, can come to that place where it's weak, it's impure, it's seared, it's defiled, and it's evil, and then, you know, we no longer will be able to clearly testify what is right and wrong, we continue doing the wrong, you know, just believing as it is, as it is, as if it is right. So, as believers, it's important for us to maintain a good, holy, pure conscience—a conscience that is free from all offense and is not dependent on the works, but is important. Uh, that is dependent on the grace of God. And you know that we are continually checking ourselves. We're constantly listening to God's voice, to a conscience and doing what is right. Okay. And then he ends this whole chapter by presenting what a true Jew is or who a true Jew is. And then, like I said, a true Jew is somebody who is not just circumcised physically, but there's a circumcision of the heart. Okay. So, um, we look at in chapter 3 what is Paul's main objective of presenting all this so far. It's basically, as I said, it's bringing them to an understanding that all of us are sinners, that we are without hope, that we are not able to save ourselves. Okay, And then he sets up the whole gospel. Remember I told you in the introduction that the gospel of Jesus is presented very beautifully in the epistle to the Romans, right? If anyone reads the book of Romans, they will understand what is salvation, they will receive salvation, and they will know how to live their uh, lives. So he's, he brings us to that place where he says, you know, he sets them uh, 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 the church at Rome to understand about, hey, how are we going to receive this salvation? It is by grace um, through faith, and it is a gift of God. And that's how we can receive salvation through Jesus Christ. Okay, so that is chapter two. We'll move on to chapter three. If anyone has any questions, you need any clarity, you can ask, please. Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll um, go on to chapter 3. Is that okay? Yes? 
So here in chapter 2, he's, uh, Paul has told the Jews that, you know, having the law and uncircumcision is of no use because they are breaking the law. So in chapter 3, he's building up on this and he kind of lessens the blow a little bit, so to say. Like he was quite harsh and strong with them in chapter 2. And in chapter 3, he's kind of lessening the, making the blow a little more softer and, you know, less. So he tells them, Hey, you people, you Jewish people, you are important, okay? You are a people whom God has given the law, okay? But when uh, what, what Paul says in chapter 2 is that neither the Jew nor the Gentile is perfect before God, okay? So what Paul is basically saying is, hey, look, Jews, you are important. I'm just kind of paraphrasing the whole thing, okay? So he's saying, hey, look, Jews, you're very important. Uh, and look, I'm not throwing you out completely out of God's plan and purpose. You are important because God has given you the law, the covenants, the prophets, yours is the forefathers. But the point I want to really make is whether you are a Jew or whether you are a Gentile, all of you have sinned or all of us have sinned before God. Okay. So by the time we go through the first half of chapter 3, this is like the main point that Paul is presenting that all of us have sinned. There is no one who is righteous before God. Then having established that we've all sinned, you know, he now gets into the gospel message. Okay. So he says, hey, you know, God has made a way for us, both Jews and Gentiles, to be forgiven. And then he starts talking about Jesus Christ, the redemption that is in Jesus, and how we freely receive that by grace. And then in chapter 4, he says it's only by faith that we can receive it, okay? He says we are all sinners, God has provided salvation, but in chapter 4, he mentions that it's only by faith. And then in chapter 5, he goes on to say it's because of the grace that we have received, okay? So that is what he has been, he's establishing here, that we've all broken the law, we're all sinners, God has provided us forgiveness, and we receive this by faith in chapter 4, and we receive this because of the grace of God that he elaborates in chapter 5, and that is what he is building this up to, okay? So let's look at uh, chapter 3, uh, we'll, we'll read chapter 3, so... If um, all of you can turn to Romans, please. Romans chapter 3. It will be good if all of you can read a few verses. Um, there are almost um, 31 verses. So I'll uh, request the participation even of the online students. If that's okay, you can unmute your mics and um, read. All of you can read maybe four or five verses, please. So we'll read chapter three. Even as you read chapter three, I just want you to, you know, uh, follow through in your Bibles. If you've remembered anything that God has spoken to you in the past, anything that he's taught you from, you know, some sermons or from your daily Bible study or something that God is speaking to you now, you can share it after we read Romans chapter 3. Anyone from the online students would like to begin? Romans chapter 3 verses 1 to 5, anyone would like to read? Okay, Nina, John, go ahead. You're able to hear me? Yes, very clearly. You can go ahead. Thank you. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracle. But what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to read? 
online students. Okay, otherwise you can go ahead. Five to ten you can read. Verse six, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my life to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are st st standardly reported and as some affirm that, that we say their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they were under sin. As, yeah. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There are none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The position of the poison of Asap is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and law and the prophets even the righteousness of god which is through faith in jesus christ to all and on all who believe for there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus whom god set forth to be propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. What is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the, the God of the Jews only? Is he not all, also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the con contrary, we establish the law. Amen. Thank you. So anything you would like to share, anything that... Uh... You know, uh, you're reminded from these verses you read before God spoke to you or you know, anything that ministered to you even as you are reading, any verse, any phrase, anything you'd like to share? Nothing? Francis, you want to share something? No? No, oh, share it. It's okay. The verse, uh, like, 8 says, like, sorry, 7 and 8. For it is the truth of God, has saying it is true, my light to his glory, when I am also still judged as a sinner, and weigh 
not say let us do evil that good may come so when i'm like when uh, nindi is uh, reading that like god give his life to redeem us then we then as like we way we are saying like okay we are in uh, is not marriage like god one person give his life to take take out the sin from us and we are doing again that thing so it like it's a foolishness and the people like who are is not believing that when they going away from the god like what the bible says like they're not who, who are saying no, there is no god they're foolishness and like kind of that thought i went okay thank you anyone else anyone else no okay online students anyone likes to share a uh, share go ahead nikhil so, so as we know we uh, bible says that we all have sinned and we all had that uh, a uh, low through what god gave in old testament but uh, here we can see in 22 even the righteousness of god which is through faith in jesus christ to all and on all who believe but as we believe in jesus christ so now uh, we don't have uh, that uh, uh, that sin because jesus already did for us that and so now we have the righteousness of god through christ as we believe whoever believe that uh, they have the righteousness of god so Uh, as we saw before we were separated from uh, god because of sin but now through jesus christ and we believe so we uh, just uh, uh, as through jesus christ we uh, came near to god so thank you anyone else online students anyone likes to share okay uh, if um, no one else has to share then we'll stop class because just one more minute uh, any questions you have anything we'll begin chapter 3 tomorrow any questions okay if there are no questions uh, we'll end class thank you all for uh, joining class we'll begin uh, chapter 3 tomorrow thank you